Um, this is often asymptomatic, at least uh, early on during the disease. Uh, um, patients have cough, uh, which initially starts as mild cough and progresses uh, to varying degrees. Uh, difficulty breathing, which may initially be present only on exertion, but slowly progresses uh, where you're able to walk less and less to the point that you might have difficulty breathing at rest as well. Um, physical exam helps us uh, diagnose this. You can hear crackles uh, or crackly sounds when you're listening to the lungs. Uh, pulmonary function test that Dr. Karika talked about, uh, essentially breathing tests, uh, looking at uh, how well you breathe in and breathe out. The things that we look for are FEC, which is how big your lungs are, how much you're able to breathe in and out. Um, the lung size, our total lung capacity, and DLC, or the diffusion capacity. What happens in pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease in scleroderma is that the lungs get stiffer and smaller, so your lung capacity decreases. And then the diffusion capacity also decreases. Diffusion capacity is a measure of gas exchange from the air to the blood vessels. And so lung functions become abnormal early on during the course, and they're a good way to follow how you are doing as far as interstitial lung diseases or pulmonary fibrosis and scleroderma. Of course, uh, uh, interstitial lung diseases are not the only thing that cause abnormal lung function tests because pulmonary hypertension that Dr. Karika talked about will cause a decreased diffusion capacity as well. Um, chest x-ray uh, is a reasonable start, but that can be often normal in patients with early interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis associated with scleroderma. The gold standard for diagnosing interstitial lung disease uh, in all patients, including with scleroderma, is the high-resolution CT of the chest, uh, which shows that the lung tissue is replaced by abnormal tissue, which is denser than the normal lung tissue. Uh, it looks more white than it should. And this is a CAT scan of a patient with scleroderma-associated pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease where the lung, which should be nice and black, is replaced by white fibrotic scar tissue. Um, there are multiple currently available therapies uh, um, cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate, azathioprine, and steroids. Um, these uh, are useful. They definitely have a role in treating scleroderma, but their benefit is modest. Um, if you look at what happens in the lungs and scleroderma, you can really divide it into two parts. One is inflammation and the other is fibrosis. Think of inflammation as a red irritable ulcer if, if you were to look at the skin. So think of it as a red irritable ulcer, whereas fibrosis is scarring that is not red, that is not irritable. So scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease is associated with two processes. Early on, you have inflammation, which is, again, think of it as red irritable tissue, and fibrosis, which is scarring, which slowly progresses. So what is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as the name implies, idiopathic, no known cause, we know that certain things like smoking and other environmental exposures increase the risk for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but we really don't know what causes idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, pulmonary, as in it involves only the lung, um, and fibrosis, as in scarring. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has typical clinical, radiologic, and histopathologic characteristics. The demographics, as in the patient groups in which it occurs, is different from that in scleroderma. These are usually much older patients, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, much more in males. Uh, it has a typical CT appearance, which is different from most uh, CTs in patients with scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease or fibrosis. And then finally, this is often diagnosed on histopathology or biopsy, and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has a typical appearance on a biopsy. Um, this is, uh, if you were to take a biopsy of a patient with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, this is what it look, would look like. This is a piece of lung tissue. Um, white with slight areas of pink is normal. This dark pink area is abnormal. And again, you find that there is patchy fibrosis or scarring mostly on the outside of the lung. A proportion of patients with scleroderma also have these findings. Uh, this is what the CAT scan appears in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Again, um, think of it as slices through your chest. Uh, the black are the normal areas, the white are the abnormal areas, and we find that scarring is mostly on the outside, more on the lower part of the lung, and becomes less as we go up. Again, this, this pattern is unusual in scleroderma, but a small proportion of patients have this finding. So if we compare scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, again, I want to make sure and that we're very clear that 
Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a distinct disorder from scleroderma-associated uh, interstitial lung disease. Uh, these are very two different entities. Um, scleroderma affects multiple organ systems, skin, gastrointestinal tract, uh, all the way from the esophagus to the anus like uh, we just talked. Um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis affects only the lung. Uh, Scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease or uh, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, as we talked about, has two separate components. One is the inflammatory component. Again, think of it as, as a red irritable tissue, and the other is scarring or fibrosis. Um, no significant inflammation is present in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but scarring is present in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Similarities. So, although idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a very distinct disorder which is different from scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease, they do, share, they do share some similarities. And the similarity is that both of them have fibrosis. Um, although early on inflammation is more prevalent in scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease, later in the disease process, fibrosis becomes more prominent. And this fibrosis is what is present in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as well. The scleroderma-associated fibrosis does not respond to currently known treatments, which target mostly inflammation. Idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which we've also learned over the last five to 10 years, does not respond to anti-inflammatory therapies such as cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, mycophenolate, which have all been tried in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and shown to be of no benefit. And so we'll take a look at two studies that have recently come, come, come out uh, these were uh, published or announced in uh, May of this year, and these are studies in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Oh. So again, uh, coming back to this, although scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis are separate entities, they do share the common fibrosis. Um, this is a study in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, not in scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease, of a drug called perfenidone, which is an antifibrotic drug. This was a placebo-controlled trial in that half the patients got the drug and half the patients got the placebo. Uh, they looked at how patients who got the placebo did with respect to patients who got the drug with respect to how much they were able to walk, what their breathing tests were, and whether they lived any longer or not. So again, this is a slide that shows time on the x-axis. We have patients on the y-axis. And so the thing that they're measuring in this slide is decreased FVC or death. So essentially, they're looking at what proportion of patients had decreased lung function over time. The blue bars are the dark blue bars, or the dark green bars, are perfenidone. Uh, the light bars are the placebo, which is you know, the sugar pill or a medication, no active medications were given to these. So higher bars mean more patients had worse disease. And so we find that patients who had the placebo had more of them had worsening of their lung function when compared to patients who got perfenidone. Um, they also looked at uh, how much the patients were able to walk. And again, this is the time on the x-axis, the, the proportion of patients on the y-axis the lighter bars represent patients who got placebo or no drug, and the darker bar represent patients who got uh, perfenidone. Uh, taller bars are worse. Shorter bars are better because that means a smaller proportion of patients did not worsen. And again, here they found that patients who got perfenidone had less worsening of uh, their walk distance. Then finally, we have time on the x-axis and mean change in force vital capacity, which is, how big your, which is a measure of how big your lungs are. And they found that, again, the light uh, uh, plot, lighter plot is placebo, and the darker plot is perfenidone. And they found that patients who got the perfenidone, which is an antifibrotic drug, had a lower decline in their lung function, which means the lung function didn't decrease as much as it would have had they not gotten the drug. And then finally, they combined this result with the, the results of two other studies, and they found that patients Again, this is uh, time on the y-axis and the proportion of patients, and this is progression-free survival. So they looked at combined three things, you know, worsening of lung function, walk distance, or whether they died, and they found that patients, sorry, I lost my screen here. Uh, that's all right. Okay, sorry. So, 
um, this is a second drug called nintetinib, which is actually a class of drugs called the mTOR inhibitors. This is actually an anti-cancer drug, but this was tried in pulmonary fibrosis because fibrosis or scarring shares common mechanisms with certain tumors. And so again, uh, this was a placebo-controlled trial. These were two separate studies. Um, they gave two-thirds of the patients, this is a two and two is to three, so a group of the patients got uh, nintetinib, whereas the other group got the placebo, and they compared the nintetinib versus the placebo group, and the results were similar to that uh, of the perfenadone study. And so if you look at, this is the, uh, this is the lung volume here, this is the nintetinib versus placebo, and we found that the decrease in lung function in patients with nintetinib was less when compared to patients who got the placebo. Um, again, similar result in the other study, and this is time on the x-axis, and the lung function on the y-axis, and we found that patients who received the drug had a lower decrease in lung function. So again, uh, scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, they are very distinct disorders, but they do share a common pathway or mechanism, which is fibrosis or scarring, which doesn't respond to currently available therapies. Um, this thing is being, these drugs are currently being studied in scleroderma. Um, we have the LOTUS study, which was the safety and tolerability of perfenadone in patients with systemic sclerosis-associated ILD. Um, it's likely, although we're not sure, that a follow-up study would be expected, and we, we anticipate a similar follow-up study in Tedinib as well. So to summarize, um, scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease and, or pulmonary fibrosis shares common mechanisms in uh, patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Um, later in the course of scleroderma-associated interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, at this point, we don't have effective therapies. We do have two therapies which have a modest benefit in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. These therapies can, should, and will be explored in patients with scleroderma. It, it, it remains to be seen whether they will be effective or not, but I think it's possible that uh, these therapies uh, uh, may have uh, benefit in patients with pulmonary fibrosis and scleroderma associated with cystic lung disease. Um, currently, studies underway will answer this question. Um, I'll stop here.